One thing that came out on my podcast with him, because I asked him, there's this misconception that like that old people or people with that were poor lost money at my firm. It just wasn't true. Like it was not true. Like I ran the firm and like this was a policy in place. Like we only call rich people. Now it's, A, it was on purpose. I didn't want people that couldn't afford to lose to lose. But also, because I'm a greedy bastard. Like, hey, you know what? You know, if you're going to go take money, you might as well take it from those who have the most because you're going to get the most. So I'm not trying to say I was the greatest guy ever, but I certainly pur purposely steered aware, st stared clear of people that could not afford to lose money, right? <laughs> All right, so let, let's talk about that other stuff, though. Let's talk about the stuff that you really, sure. it's, it's your area of expertise. First off, I, I am sure that everyone watching this has seen Wolf of Wall Street, but for the people that, that aren't sure who Jordan Belfort is, g give me the, the minute elevator pitch elevator. On, uh, what, yeah, on what you've done. So, you know, when I was very young, we grew up in Long Island, both of us, right? I, yeah. I um, started a firm uh, in the late eighties. Um, and I uncovered this niche in the market for selling $5 stocks to the richest Americans. No one had tried it before. And I then very shortly thereafter discovered a way of training salespeople. So I could take average people that really weren't great at sell sales and make them unbelievable at sales. Those two things combined resulted in me building what became very quickly the largest firm in the country back when I was still in my early to mid twenties and I was making a million bucks a week and I was from a poor family and I absolutely went hog wild and lived out every <laughs> adolescent fantasy I could ever have dreamed of from, you know, buying a white Ferrari Testarossa cause Don Johnson had one in Miami Vice from taking a private jet out to LA and renting out the presidential the Beverly Wilshire cause Richard Gere had done it in Pretty Woman. You know, I went, oh, I went full <laughs> on there. And ultimately it started off as a beautiful, amazing thing. And I lost my way and I started manipulating some stocks, smuggled money to Switzerland, clients lost money. I went to jail and I wrote a book about it and that book became a movie. And I got really lucky because when you make a movie, there's two things you can ha that can happen. You could like have a movie made about you, and and I love Danny DeVito, but let's just say you can get played by Danny DeVito, <laughs> or no offense, no offense, no offense. Yeah. I love Danny, by the but or Leonardo DiCaprio, and have Martin Scorsese direct that movie. And I have to say, you know, the, what they did is they they took a book that I worked very hard on and I was proud of, but they. Uh, and, the, and the writer, Terrence Winter, is a brilliant guy. And, um, and all of us together created what really ended up being a very special, amazing movie that has certainly stood the test of time and become probably one of the biggest cult hits of all time. And, and, and I think it will, I, I don't see it ending. I think it's just here to stay forever because it really connects oh, no, with people. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's, it's awesome. <laughs> it's just a, it's a, it's, it, who could, Scorsese, what can you say, right? <laughs> it, it's just perfect. I mean, the movie really from start to finish is, yeah. is just perfect. The speech that Leo, that you give, I mean, is just absolutely epic and has been memed into a million other things. I know. <laughs> but you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned we're, that we're both from Long Island. You're, you're about, I, you were born in 62, right? Am I allowed to say that? Correct. Am I allowed yeah, sure. to say that? So you so you, you got, look, you got four. I look pretty good considering all the <laughs> drugs I've consumed, right? I mean, good Lord. I should be like Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, but I, you know, thank God I did pretty well, you know? No, no, I can't see through your skin. You're doing all right. Um, <laughs> But no, you're, you got 14 years on me, but we basically come from virtually the same town. And, and a lot of yeah. the guys that are in the movie that you train, in effect, are, are from Syosset, they're from Plainview. It's a lot of these, these local Long Island towns, you know, right outside New York City. And we talked about this when I was on your show, but I'm sort of fascinated by it. it there is something about Long Island that has generated so many Talented people, corrupt people, comedians, actors, money guys. David, like, I, it's nuts. I was going to say, you know, like, as you were I didn't want to interrupt you. I was, I, was, I was like, there's something in the water. There's like something in the used water. To always to say, there's something in the water. Like, I, even in my apartment building, on my floor, I lived in this six story, low rent apartment building. Three people on my floor went out to Wall Street and built massive firms. Now, one of them, besides he was a good friend, so he worked with, another was an independent guy named Randy Pace, who I babysat for his kids. He's 10, he's passed <laughs> away now. He had one of the largest firms on Wall Street in the 70s. Like, so it's like there's something, it's, it's, and, and the Syosset, it's like the Syosset 
Jericho thing. I was like Bayside. Like it's, and I'll tell you what I think it is. I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it is a combination of proximity to massive wealth. Yeah. But not actually having massive wealth. It's about not being so poor that it seems out of reach. Mm -hmm. It's about having a great education. So it creates this almost aspiration. Like you almost feel like it's just there. It's within your reach. You see it. It's not yours. You have, you're given the tools because like, I think what's really sad sometimes in some really, you know, kids, they grow up in these bad areas. They, they really, they have the deck stacked against them. Like they don't get a mm -hmm. great education. Um, they have a lot of gang violence, like things that it's almost like they have to really be special to make it out. And that hopefully you know, will continue to change and get better. But I think we didn't have that. Like we, although we were, I wasn't born rich. I, this shot that something bad had to happen for me not to get out to the next level. Like there was such a, a, a pathway out. And I think part of it is that stressing education for sure was just a big thing in my area. And also there was like this mythical thing of like, you go there, you move out to Long Island, you get rich. Like th that yeah. was a path. And I think that's part of it, you know? And I think that, 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 that if you take those things and it creates a sort of competition and pathway to success. That's my opinion. So, so when you were when you were building the companies and you figured out how you could do this by sort of reaching the rich people with something that wasn't normally thought of as kind of in their world, what what kind of like ethical issues were were you having as you were doing it? Like at first, did you think it was fully legit and then kind of lost control, or did you kind of know, or did you not know, or like what were, no, what were you yeah, struggling with? Very good question. So number one, th there's, there's two things, and it's a very interesting fact that like, came out on my podcast. I, I had the FBI agent who indicted me. He's a friend of mine now, wonderful guy. Oh man, I, all right, I, I gotta listen jail. to that. Yeah, he's like, you should have him on your podcast. He's a great guy. Yeah. And, and one thing that came out on my podcast with him, because I asked him, there's this misconception that like that old people or people with, that were poor lost money at my firm. It just wasn't true. Like it was not true. Like I ran the firm and like this was a policy in place. Like we only call rich people. Now it's A, it was on purpose. I didn't want people that couldn't afford to lose to lose. But also because I'm a greedy bastard. Like, hey, you know why? You know, if you're going to go take money, you might as well take it from those who have the most because you're going to get the most. So I'm not trying to say I was the greatest guy ever, but I certainly pur purposely steered aware, st stared clear of people that could not afford to lose money, right? But yet the perception was that people that couldn't afford lost money. The FBI agent clarified it because what happened was I left the firm. I sold the firm in 95. And after that and before that, it was very controlled. And we were basically, I wouldn't, listen, it wasn't like stealing. It wasn't, it started off perfectly legit. And then it started to spiral out of control, but it was very contained, about 95% legit. I would say now that given what I see on Wall Street, what I did was 100% legitimate. Like huh. now, given what I see happening every single day, I, I used to always say I deserve to go to jail. Now I don't really think so anymore because there's such corruption on Wall Street. It's like so bad now. I really, you know, I, I say, well, okay, well, I did things wrong, but it's not nearly, I didn't bankrupt Greece or Iceland at least. So, I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not that bad a guy, right? So, you know, seriously, <laughs> the, the things that you yeah. see now happening in Maine in the bigger firms is unbelievable. But the, the big mistake I made was this lapse of ethics one step at a time. So I want to be clear. I did break the law. I didn't yeah. deserve to go to jail for breaking the law, although my, my per perspectives changes what I see is comparably, but it's still, I, I don't want to say I didn't, I did break the law. It started off perfectly legitimate, trying to make people money. And then I made some fundamental errors and I allowed the firm to grow too fast and I lost control of it. And then the first time I really broke the law, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do it once. I'll never do it again. But then my line of morality got moved a bit. So next mm -hmm. time, you know, you do things good again for them. Then next time you step over, it's a little bit further to the right. And then back again. And before you know it, through these tiny, almost imperceptible steps, you're doing things you thought you'd never do. You're associated with people you never thought you'd associate with. And it all seems perfectly okay. It's like you dip your toe into a bathtub, piping hot water. You're like, oh, wow, so hot, right? And then three minutes later, you're in the water and it feels fine. Now, when I was a young boy, I remember distinctly think, oh, I know what's going on. I get in the bath and I'm, the water's cooling down because my body's cool. But no, the water's not cooling down. You're just getting used to it. 
Yeah. And that was the mistake I made. And, and it's a mistake I'm very aware of today. Like, I won't even take one little step over the ethical line. Like, I am real, I'm more careful than anybody else because I can't afford to have a second hiccup here, right? So I, yeah. like, I always say to myself, like, any action I take, like, if it's even the slightest bit unethical, I just, I just won't do it. You know, I'm not going to take that chance. That's my best protection against ever doing anything wrong again. And I think it's really good for everyone to look that way. But there are some things in life where there's gray areas. And there's nothing wrong with playing in the gray. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I think that the test is if you're going to hurt someone else along the way. That's probably the, the single thing that that's like, eh, if you're going to hurt someone else, if it's a victim list in the gray, okay, well, you can consider it. But other than that, it's a no-go. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about lifestyles, instead of nonstop yelling, check out our lifestyle playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're both right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.